Welcome to another amazing podcast from Encounter City Church. To stay connected, you can find us on Facebook or go to www.encountercitychurch.com.au. We pray that you have a fresh encounter with Jesus today. Good morning. Happy birthday to all those people whose names were up there. And I heard a little whisper, just a little whisper, that uh, somebody's having a birthday today. Somebody, but we won't mention Belinda's name because she gets embarrassed. But happy birthday. If you're a guest, we just want to welcome you this morning. Welcome to Good Friday and welcome to Encounter City Church. And we just pray this morning that you have an encounter with Jesus because it's not about anything that we are specifically doing except for creating an opportunity for you to come and meet Jesus who is the most amazing, amazing person to have ever walked the planet. And if you're here this morning, don't just shoot off. I know it's busy and, and stuff, but let us say hello. And there's some coffee and hot cross buns out there later on. So come and have a hot cross bun with us. That'd be great. I just want to thank Pastor Phil for the opportunity to, uh, to preach a Good Friday service. It's, it's new for me and it's, it's so exciting as we, as we come together to remember what Christ really did on that cross. And I want to look at it from a little bit of a different angle this morning. So as I was starting to prepare this message, it, it reminded me of when I really first started to look, and I'm going to preach on, I'm going to preach about Judas and, and his life, right? So I'll just put that out there really quickly. But it reminded me of when I was younger and I had this horrible, horrible fear of death. And I know that's, that's the same for other people. And look, it, it affected me and it affected me in a way that... Um, what had happened is I'd been reading the Left Behind series of books. Has anyone read those? <laughs> right. And there's a pastor in there, Bruce Barnes, right? and he'd been going to church and he'd been doing the right things on the outside, right? but he never really had this relationship, this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so everyone's taken in the rapture and he's, and he's left behind. And that freaked me out because I was going to church and I was trying to work out where I was. Right? With, with my life and my walk and I'd wake up in the morning or something and everybody would be gone. <laughs> Anyone ever had a moment like that? Everyone would be gone and I'd be like, oh, where are they? And I'd check the rooms and, and, and they weren't there and the only person I could think of was um, my grandma, Yendis. And if you ever met Yendis, she was the most beautiful person in the world <laughs> and I knew that she was going to heaven. And so, and so I'd ring her up <laughs> because I knew that if she answered the phone that, that, um, that I hadn't missed it, right? <laughs> but but as, I, as I got a little bit older and I started to really understand um, what was going on with these relationships and understanding a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is the only way, right, then those fears alleviated, and I was good. So this morning I've titled this message Lessons from a Traitor. Right? You probably were thinking, I didn't come to church on Good Friday to hear about lessons from a traitor. But look, this is all going to point to the cross. I want you to understand that right from the very outset. So Judas is known in the Bible as the betrayer. Okay? Judas is one of the most recognized names among the original 12 disciples. But his life remains in some ways a sad, uh, a sad mystery or perhaps more accurately a sad tragedy. We understand how his life ended in suicide, but the mystery of Judas revolves around missing the majesty of Jesus Christ while surrounded with an amazing opportunity that I'm sure anybody here would give their left arm for, right, to spend three years on earth walking around physically with Jesus. Judas goes beyond refusing to accept this amazing gift of eternal life, right? He betrays the Son of God with a kiss. You see, betrayal is something only a friend or a loved one can do. You can't be betrayed by somebody that means nothing to you. To betray somebody, you must first secure the trust or loyalty of another person. An enemy can attack you. Your competition can deceive you. A foe may plan for your destruction, but betrayal is a grievous act committed by one who has pledged support. Rejection can cause a wound, but betrayal pours salt in it and makes it sting. Failure can knock you off your feet, but betrayal kicks you while you are down. 
Criticism and insult hurt your pride, but betrayal really, truly breaks your heart. As I said, the Scriptures refer to Judas, uh, Judas as the betrayer, and his betrayal was almost like this kiss of death, and I think that's where we sometimes get, get that, uh, that saying or that term from. I think it's really interesting, and we'll look at that um, passage of Scripture in a minute, but when Jesus is saying that someone's going to betray me, he actually says um, he's going to betray me, he's going to betray the Son of Man. It's going to betray the Son of Man. It, it takes it away from, um, from just a relationship to this title where Judas is actually going to betray the Son of Man. It's, it's not even just betrayal, it's almost treason. As we look forward through a couple of scriptures in a minute, Judas opposed the work of God for selfish reasons. Right? Jesus exposes this, these acts and, and as we go on, right, you just got to think to yourself, how did you get it so wrong? Judas, how did you get it so wrong? But it's something that we do as well. We get things so wrong sometimes, but there's always a way back and that way is the cross. Amen. So there will always remain some questions about the life of Judas, but one thing is certain and it's the powerful warning that this story provides for both Christians and non-believers alike, right? Judas is a real-life illustration of the danger of being religious but being lost. He is the most startling example that it's possible to know about Jesus but never know Jesus as one of his sheep, right? And never know his voice. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he warned about the deception that eventually destroyed Judas, Judas declared there would be, uh, sorry, Jesus declared there'd be wolves in sheep's clothing. He warned of false teachers. He explained that weeds would grow alongside the good wheat, but the day of judgment would reveal the true believers. I know it's a bit heavy and it's going to, I promise you, it's going to lighten up, okay? I promise you it's going to lighten up. But I want you to really understand that, that what's happening with Judas wasn't this split-second decision, right? He was given so many warnings. Jesus was with him showing so much grace and so much love and so much mercy, but he still kept going down these patterns. And I want you to understand that today because it's never too late for you to come to the cross. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus preached about those who claimed uh, to perform God-honouring works, but he said of them, I never knew you. We need to allow this tragic story of Judas to remind us of the clear teaching of Jesus. Being aware of his ministry is not the same as embracing him as the Son of God who gave his life on a cross, paid a price that wasn't his to pay to redeem us from our sin and make a way back to the Father. Yeah. Jesus is the master teacher. Judas is walking with Jesus, the master teacher, for three years, right? Right? Jesus used numerous illustrations in his lessons about the kingdom of God and his role in establishing the kingdom. And Judas' story almost reads like one of those parables, right? Ending, ending with a fierce reality, suffering the consequences of bad decisions. We have to be so careful not to just dismiss or gloss over Judas' story. Judas was a real man. You need to understand this. Judas was a real man who walked on the earth with a very real Jesus for three years, but he never allowed the power of Christ to transform his life. You know, I've often thought if we look at the life of Judas, the question comes to mind, was he really saved? Was he, was he really a believer of Jesus Christ? Was he a believer who was come, overcome on a split-second temptation to betray Jesus for personal gain. Because even the Apostle Paul admitted that he sometimes struggled with sin. Well, every day he beats his body into submission, right? However, if we really start to dig deeper the account, uh, into the accounts concerning Judas, they paint a picture of a man who never accepted God's amazing grace to be born again. So this morning I just want to quickly go through a couple of accounts in Judas's life through Jesus' ministry time leading up to when he betrays him. So if you want to turn to John 6, 66 to 71, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. It says this, At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, Are you also going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, 
to whom will we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus said, I chose the 12 of you, but one is a devil. He was speaking of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, one of the 12 who would later betray him. See, even at, the, even at this stage of ministry, right, Jesus is still showing so much grace and so much mercy. And he says, look, I know your heart. I know what's going on. But, but come on, I want to give you some advice. I want to help you out here. I'm giving you a clue. I'm giving you a tip. You don't have to go down this path. In John 12, 3 to 6, we skip forward again. It says, Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said that that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. And in verse 6, it goes on to say, not that he cared for the poor, he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole for himself. You see, in that passage of Scripture, we're looking at the heart of Judas here, where he's still, he's walking every day with Jesus and he's seeing miracles and he's seeing these things happen, but he's not getting it. He's not getting it. He's staying in his pattern. See, he didn't like the way that Jesus was being worshipped. Right? This... Mary is there. She's giving everything. She's going, look, this is so this is expensive, but it's not enough for you, God. And I'm still going to wipe your feet with my hair. And Judas is going, no. Perfume, you know, that's silly. That's not the way you worship God. You give the money in. You give the money in. I think that might have been because he was taking some of it as well. You know, he had his hand in the cookie jar. We move forward again, Matthew 26, 14 to 16. It says, When Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples, went to the leading priests and asked, How much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. From that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Judas was an opportunist, let's be honest. He was an opportunist looking for a quick way to line his pockets and lift his standing. He liked that. The thing that really amazes me about that particular portion of Scripture, right, is that it was Judas's instigation to go to the priests. He knew that they were after Jesus and he knew they were looking for something, but it was Judas that went to the priests and said, hey, how much are you going to give me if I bring him to you? Judas sought out the priests. It wasn't the other way around. What did it say about the way that the priests perceived Judas that they paid him in advance for his services? I don't know. Is there something that he's, that he's emitting from himself or emitting from himself that says, you know, I'm, I'm a trustworthy, untrustworthy person that's going to get the job done for you? The priests weren't worried about him keeping his end of the deal, but knew that he would betray. There's something in that, something in that for us all to unpack later on. <laughs> then we skip forward, Matthew 26, 20 to 25. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table, and we all know this passage of Scripture, with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, am I the one Lord? He replied, one of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me. For the Son of Man, this is what I was talking about, treason, right? The Son of Man, not just I must die, the Son of Man must die, as the Scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, you have said it. Jesus told him, you have said it. Still, the grace and mercy and the kingdom that Jesus was describing to his disciples and people that were following him, right? He's still portraying all this to Judas and still saying, come on, mate, there's time. 
There's time. There's time. You don't have to keep going down this track. My grace is sufficient for you. You don't have to keep going. Come back to the cross. Come back to the cross. You see, we can deceive others. Right? And we can keep putting on facades and we eventually believe our own lies. Right? But we can never deceive God. And then Matthew 27, 3 to 5. And then it's going to start to get a little bit lighter, I promise. (laughs) says this, When Judas, who had betrayed him, realised that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. So he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the priests and the elders. I've sinned, he declared, for I have betrayed an innocent man. What do we care? The priest retorted. That's your problem. Then Judas, then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and went out and hanged himself. A pretty sad story, right? Judas still didn't get what Jesus was trying to teach him for three years. He still didn't understand the kingdom of God or the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ who he walked so closely with. So we can conclude from those scriptures, right, that Judas refused to believe the claims of Christ, that he was the Son of God. We can conclude that he opposed the worship of Christ by others if he didn't like their style. We know that he stole money that was given to support the ministry of Christ. This is all patterns in his life. We know that he used his association with Jesus and the disciples for personal gain And further on in the scriptures where he actually goes and gives Jesus a kiss on the cheek, we know that he displays a total disregard for their safety. He mocked the Son of God by betraying him with a kiss. This personal thing, this intimate thing where you kiss somebody and he betrayed him. Just real funny. Well, not funny, but it's really interesting that Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth and the life. Right? It's almost like Jesus that Judas kissed, kissed the door to heaven and still missed it. And he died, a broken and disturbed man who was unwilling to call upon Christ for forgiveness. The account says he was filled with remorse, but it doesn't mention that he was repentant. From the pattern we've seen in Judas's life, right, he was filled with remorse, but he was also probably worrying about the kickback. If we, if we follow the pattern, he was probably worrying about the kickback that he was going to get after Jesus had been condemned. He was worried what the disciples were going to say. I believe in the, that the words in Matthew 7, 23, which is, says, I never knew you, right, are prophetic words that apply to Judas. Sadly, they apply as well to many of us right, who know about Jesus but have never responded to his call and accept the gift of eternal life. The story of Judas is not intended to be this tragic entertaining, sort of Shakespearean-like tale, right? God preserved, you need to understand this. You need to understand this more that God preserved this account in Scripture to inspire and guide us all to accept the gift of eternal life made possible by what happened on that cross, by what happened by that burial going to the tomb and then the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I remember, um, so I'm doing my my traineeship with Pastor Phil. <laughs> and I remember a, um, uh, we were at a funeral a little while ago. I won't mention the person's name, but um, Pastor Phil said to me that regardless of, of whether that person would have known Christ or not, something that you can always say at a funeral, this is right, right? Yeah, is that they would, they would want you to know that there is a heaven and a hell, right? They want you to know that Jesus is real. So I am picturing this morning, what are some tips, right? What are the lessons from a traitor. What are the lessons that Judas would give us this morning if he was here? What, what's the advice that he would give us to look out for in our life? And I think the first one that he would give us is that, and you've heard this many times from this pulpit, but your heart follows your treasure. Mark 8.36 in the New Living Translation says this, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? 
See, God's not opposed to wealth. You've got to understand that. God's not opposed to wealth. But the, but the Bible reveals, as in the life of Judas, that greed can enslave a soul, preventing a person from receiving Christ. Because your heart follows what you value. Right? If you put your time into the kingdom of God and your treasure into the kingdom of God, then your heart will naturally follow that. If you put your time into your four-wheel drive, no, into your, I'll pick something else. If you put your time into, I'm trying to think what I can say. I'm looking around this room and I'm thinking, I could say anything right now and it's going to offend somebody. <laughs> If you put your time into skeet shooting, <laughs> that's all I can think of. If you put your time into skeet shooting and you, and you put all your money into that, that's where your heart's going to be. Let's put our heart into the kingdom of God. Judas would be saying, put your heart into the kingdom of God. Get a revelation. Invest into it. Invest into it. Invest into it. Invest into it because your heart's going to follow. See, greed was a, was a trigger, was a trigger for Judas. He wanted wealth. It was Judas that instigated, as I said, instigated going to the priest to negotiate a price to turn over, uh, to turn over Jesus. You know, working on this week's silver price, and I looked this up last night really quickly. Silver is 47 cents per gram USD. And historical data, uh, coupled with this historical data on the weight of a silver coin, if you melted that silver down, Judas betrayed Jesus for the equivalent of somewhere between $197 and $214 in today's currency. Now, I know that the weight of silver doesn't necessarily mean that's the price of a coin. So if it was worked on the, on the coin value, it's probably worth somewhere between $2,000 and $6,000. Can you imagine betraying an innocent person for somewhere between $2,000 and $6,000? Someone that you walked with for three years. It's amazing. It, it blows my mind. Because I couldn't even think of doing that to my worst enemy, let alone somebody that I'd walked with and called friend and eaten meals with. And I just don't get it. I don't get it. But this is what happens when, when our heart follows our treasure in the wrong place. We let these things come in. See, if we let our, fle our flesh rule our spirit man, we quickly devalue, we quickly devalue what is really priceless. Point two this morning. or well, the second lesson from a trader. Sincerity trumps deceit. It is possible to fool others into thinking that you've got it all together. It is, po it is so possible to put up a facade. It's so possible to be, you know, to try and put on something that you're not, right? It's, it's a really easy thing to do. But you know what? If, if Judas had, had gone to the disciples and gone to Jesus and he said, look, just between us, I'm really struggling here. I'm really struggling with my motivation and I'm really struggling with my heart and I'm really struggling with this need for money and status. The disciples would have embraced him and said, can I help you? Come on, let's do this together. Let's stand side by side. But he didn't. They, at the time, the disciples, I believe the disciples didn't even know that he was pinching money. I mean, this is written in an account after the fact, filling in some of the pieces and... I don't think they even, they even knew. Think about it. The disciples had so much trust in the facade that Judas was putting on that they made him the treasurer. But you can't fool God. See, Judas trapped himself in these patterns of deceit. If he had been sincere, if he had been sincere, he would have truly experienced the love and the grace of Jesus and it would have started to transform his life. Third lesson from a trader this morning, and I think that this is probably the most important one. Choose to be transformed. You can choose to be transformed. Salvation through Jesus Christ creates positive change in a person's life. Right? The Bible is filled with examples of people who had a life-altering encounter with Christ. Judas never changed because he didn't want to. 
Right? He was having a life, a life changing encounter with Jesus Christ every day, but he didn't want to change. Romans 12 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need revelation, and again, it's been preached so many times, that we are new creations in Jesus Christ. We need to make a decision in ourselves to hunger and thirst and yearn for more of Jesus and less of us, because that's the transforming power of the cross. We move out of this, by Jesus going to the cross, we move out of this, this time of law and, and all these sacrifices, but Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice on the cross to make a way that we can come and we can, we can lay it down before him at the foot of the cross. The longer you keep a foot in the world, or the longer we keep a foot in the world, the harder, the harder it gets to respond to Jesus and his perfect will for our lives. Our hearts grow harder without Jesus. That's so true. Our hearts grow harder without Jesus. More world comes in where there should be more Jesus because we're trying to fill this void and we're filling it with the wrong stuff. So our hearts harden and it makes it so much harder to turn, to turn, to turn back to Jesus. Don't confuse knowing information. And I think that this is probably the biggest thing for Judas is that he confused knowing information about Jesus with actually knowing Jesus. Acquiring facts is not the same thing as saving faith. Job at the end of his life said, I've heard of you, but now I know you. Jules, why don't you get you to come up and help me this morning because I really believe that God wants to do a work in people's hearts here this morning. Many Christians around the place will recognise the name of John Wesley as a powerful preacher and hero of Christian faith. What many don't know is that John Wesley was saved, converted, born again as an adult after having already served as a missionary to Savannah, Georgia in 1730s. While travelling from England to the colony of Georgia, Wesley's ship encountered a terrible storm that he thought would take the life of all aboard. During the storm, Wesley noticed the confident faith from another Christian man named Spangenberg. The two men talked about the difference in the confidence of faith in Spangenberg in facing death and the fear of Wesley. Spangenberg asked John Wesley a question that he described Oh, that Wesley described as embarrassing. He said, Mr. Wesley, do you know Jesus Christ? Wow, right? Wow. John Wesley responded, Sir, I know Christ to be the Saviour of the world. Spangenberg then asked Wesley a question that would change Wesley's life and the history of the world, right? Spangenberg said, True but do you know that He has saved you? Luke 22, sorry, Luke 23, 39 to 43. As we really bring it back to the cross this morning, says one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So this is Jesus hanging on the cross, two thieves, criminals beside him on either side. So one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you'll be with me in paradise. We see a stark contrast here with the way that Judas' life ended and the way that the thief on the cross's life ended. There is so much power in the cross if you understand that the cross that Jesus went to the cross to pay a price. Jesus went to the cross to pay a price that was not his to pay, 
that was ours to pay, but he did it in loving grace to bring us back to a place where we could be reconciled with God the Father. The cross is for everyone. The cross is for everyone. It doesn't matter what you've done. It didn't matter what Judas had done. All he needed to do was call upon the name of Jesus and he would have been saved. But he went back to his old routines. We saw in that passage of Scripture, he started trying to undo the mistake. He's throwing the coins back, saying, you take them, you take them. I don't want them. Take them. Instead of understanding what Jesus had been saying to him the whole time, he was trying to undo his mistakes. And God's not saying that. Jesus isn't saying that. He's saying, don't undo your mistakes. It doesn't matter. Come as you are to me. Come as you are to me. Because I want to make you a new creation. That's why we call it being born again. You're born again as a new creation in Christ. And whatever you've done is thrown away into a sea of forgetfulness. And that's not to say keep running back to that. Right? But it's saying, be transformed by Jesus. Would you just stand to your feet this morning. I want to ask that question. I want to ask that question that Spangenberg asked John Wesley. And I want to ask that to everybody in this room this morning. It doesn't matter if you've been here for five minutes or if you've been here for 40 years. You see, Jesus, oh sorry, Judas knew that Jesus gave sight to the blind. Judas helped the disciples distribute a miraculous meal to over 5,000 people. Judas saw Jesus walk on water and commanded the wind and the waves to submit to his authority. Judas knew that Jesus claimed to be the saviour of the world, but Judas did not accept Jesus as his saviour. So this morning, I want to ask you, do you know Jesus? And while everyone's eyes are closed in this place, if you are not 100% confident in yourself that if something happened today, that you would go to heaven, I want to say to you this morning, do you know Jesus? Will you be brave this morning and put up your hand and say, you know what? I need a surety. I need a surety in my faith. I need to know Jesus. I've heard about Him, but this morning I need to know Him. Can I ask you to be brave and just raise your hands because I'm going to pray in a minute and I'd like to include you in that prayer. Just want to give it another moment. I'm not playing games here this morning. I'm really not. I really believe that there are people here that need to know Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay, everyone in this room, just say this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I come before you as a sinner. Thank you for dying on a cross for me. Thank you for your beautiful gift of salvation. And this morning I declare that I will live for you for the rest of my days. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Awesome. Just while you're standing this morning, I just want to lead into communion. What a great time to do communion. And I think enough's been said this morning about what Christ has done on the cross. But what I'd love to do is have a few minutes of reflection time on the power of the cross and what the cross has done for me personally and for you personally because we all have our own stories, yeah? So whilst you have that reflection time, Brad and I have just got an item that we'd love to play from for you, so just keep your eyes closed. And just reflect on the words of this song. Well, 
could have said that a man would climb a mountain just to be with the one he loved. How many times has he broken that promise? It has never been done. Well, I never climbed the highest mountain, but I walked the road to Calvary just to be with you. I would do anything There's no price I would not pay No, and just to be with you I would give everything Yes, I would give my life away Yeah, yeah I've heard it said that a man would swim the ocean just to be with the one he loves. All of those dreams are an empty emotion. They can never be Just to be with you, oh, just to be with you. Take. This morning, why don't we just take the bread together as we remember the body that was broken for us. Let's just take that now together. just take the cup together the cup that resents the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins
Let's just take a moment to just thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you did on that cross, God. Even though I was so unworthy, thank you, God. Thank you that before you knew me, you still went and paid that price. Thank you for the destiny that you've enabled for me by your selfless act on that cross, God. Thank you for the power that we receive through your sacrifice on the cross, God. Thank you for that ultimate gift of eternity. Thank you for that gift of eternity, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This morning, just as we bring our service to a close, I just want to say thanks for being here. (laughs) Thanks for being here. But you know, I just want to say Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. I just want to encourage you again that it doesn't matter what you've done in your life. And it doesn't even matter really what you're going to do. If you come back to Him with true repentance, not just remorse, but true repentance, He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And He'll forgive you because of His grace and His mercy. So this morning, we're just going to open up the altar as Jules plays some, some wonderful music for us. If you need prayer in your life or if you made a decision this morning to follow Jesus or you recommitted your life, we'd love to pray with you and meet you and partner with you on that journey. But like I said before, don't run away. Don't run away. We've got hot cross buns out there. And if they don't all go today, you know, I've had enough already, but I don't I don't need to be eating 10 more hot cross buns at staff meeting on Tuesday. So so hang around, have a coffee, have some hot cross buns. But if you need prayer in your life, come down because we want to pray with you. We want to agree with you. We want to believe you this with you this morning because this is a place of hope. This is a place of breakthrough. And this is a place where you can encounter the living Jesus Christ. I can't remember what preacher said it, but someone said it's Friday. But you know what? Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. So don't forget, obviously the altar's open for prayer. Go out there for a coffee. Don't forget Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Come and celebrate with us. Pastor Phil has got a word in season that he's going to bring and it's going to be powerful and prophetic and anointed. Don't miss that. But if you need prayer, come down now. We love you heaps. Have an amazing long weekend. Right. Don't forget church on Sunday double demerits. That's all I'm going to (laughs) say.